All right, as my kids run around screaming in the house, hello, 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 hello. Uh, welcome to White Supremacy Wednesdays. Uh, it's lunchtime uh, where I am. Hopefully you're at lunch and uh, wherever you are, whenever you are, it's 12.01 East noon uh, here in the East uh, on Wednesday, December 1st. A great day, you know, last day of the month, wake up, wake up, wake up. It's the first of the month. We're so glad uh, to be alive. So amazed that 2022 is coming to a close. You might be watching this in 2025, wherever you are, whenever you are. Greetings and welcome. I'm very excited about what we're going to talk about today. I am, This is our uh, second White Supremacy Wednesdays, and I am your host, uh, your humble host here on, uh, on White Supremacy Wednesdays, uh, and uh, glad to have you joining us here. Uh, if you're hopping in for lunch, um, you know, nosh on your salad or whatever your acai bowl or whatever it is you're eating there, uh, and try to tune in uh, and and follow along. Uh, if you're watching this via replay or listening to this on your commute home, uh, pay attention to the road, but please tune into your spirit and let uh, let a light flow. I believe that God is going to speak something uh, powerful um, to you. Uh, I'm glad to have you here. I'm glad to have you here. And um, uh, you know, obviously, what I what I have to say, I think, is important. It may not be important. You may not think it's important, uh, but I but I believe in it, and so uh, it's a joy to have it uh, to be able to share it with. Uh, anyone. Uh, so there you go. So today uh, we're going to continue from where we were last week. Uh, if you did miss uh, White Supremacy Wednesdays, number one, uh, it, we talked about the moral foundations of white supremacy. I won't go back into that too much today. It's there available for you. Uh, I'm going to kind of uh, pass the baton a little bit stick, you know, because between last Wednesday and this Wednesday. So I will kind of do a, a, a tiny review only in so far as it will segue into today's lesson. As you can see on uh, the title, we're talking about how to stop uh, watching the news like a white person. And uh, I, I realize that, um, you know, people get triggered by uh, <laughs> already today. I just posted, say, hey, join me for White Supremacy Wednesdays. And uh, this guy was like, I can't believe you fell for that narrative. I don't even know what that means, what narrative uh, they could be possibly talking about. So the title is a trigger, the idea is a trigger, and I'm just trying to share my story. I'm just trying to share my journey uh, out of white uh, supremacy. A couple disclaimers before we begin here uh, on the iPad. I got my daughter on the ones and twos today. Uh, please know that I am not trying to speak to uh, black people to tell black people how they should think, how they should feel, what they should say, etc. That's not, uh, uh, and, I, and I also realized, like we said last week, the black people are not a monolith. It's not like there's a black opinion on these matters. And honestly, I'm not even trying to speak for white people to say this is how white people think white people feel. I, I don't know how white people feel. There's not a broom large enough to sweep all white people into one uh, uh, behavioral, cultural, political, you know, um, socio-racial uh, worldview. I, I, I wouldn't say I'm honestly just talking for me. I'm trying to share my journey where I've come from uh, as I've kind of tried to unplug the um, uh, the briars of white supremacy from my soul, uh, of trying to reinterpret and re-experience the world, not from the foundation of where I come from, raised in kind of my little cloistered world, uh, but as I've endeavored over these past decades to engage it uh, more with a spirit and humanity first, rather than through uh, the filter and lens of whiteness. So that's uh, my disclaimers. I, you're not, you don't have to disagree. A lot of people disagree, but uh, many of you are going to get tremendously blessed by this. And uh, this, um, it, you, you know, if you see this and you go, um, you go, um, I agree with everything, then I haven't done my job right. If you see this and go, I don't know about that, then I have done my job right. I'm speaking from my story, my perspective, what I am learning about the ugliness in my own heart and my own journey as a recovering white supremacist. I'm sharing that and you may be a white person say, I never thought that way. You may be a black person say, I, I agree with the white supremacist or I disagree, or whatever it is, it doesn't matter, but everybody's going to have something they can learn and take away from it. As you'll see in the bottom of the right-hand corner here, I have a timer going. Uh, I don't know what it means. I'm going to try. So let's get into it today. If you haven't had a chance to share this, I would really appreciate it. It would mean the world to me and also your support. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, you can see on the bottom of the screen there, the support tab. Uh, if you believe in this content, if you're blessed by this content, you can reach us there. And also you can, uh, some of you support our uh, little uh, Mike and Connie LLC through the apps. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> this is a labor of love. All right, let's get into it today. So we're talking about why we're so divided here uh, on the iPad. And we looked at this last week. How can two people, right, uh, see the exact same news story? We're talking about how, not, how to stop watching the news as a white person. How can two people see the exact same news story or the exact same video trial verdict and protest? I mean, we both watch the exact same eight seconds of video, but have two completely different uh, interpretations. We walk away from it with two different 
uh, ideas. And we looked at last week that this comes from these kind of shared moral foundations. If you think of morals as kind of a deck of cards, we all start out when we when we hatch from our mother's womb, our uh, moral foundations are basically aligned. Uh, we, we operate from the same basic six moral foundations. Some people say these are what we've evolved to have. Other people would say that's what we were created, made in the image of God, uh, that we're all hardwired to have these things. But uh, after we emerge with this common deck, we're we don't see the world as black or white. We don't see the world as male or fem- you know, female. We don't see the world as Republican or Democrat or American or, or uh, you know, uh, Barbadian or whatever. We don't, uh, we don't see it that way. Um, we see it, uh, we come out with this kind of image of God uh, morality that's, that's uh, what some people would say, our instincts, etc. And then we get conditioned. So we have our 52 cards uh, uh, that come out of the package kind of aligned similarly uh, and then they get shuffled over time, and certain cards get placed near the top, and certain cards get placed near the bottom, and we uh, play them in different sequence. So here is our deck of cards, right? Morals, right? Uh, the M, the O, the R, the A, the L, the S, right? So the morals, and those moral impulses uh, are what we operate by. Uh, and so uh, we have these internal moral impulses, and they express themselves. So the moral impulse of mercy expresses itself as care, kindness, protection. And this is red, yellow, brown, black, white, LGBTQ, straight, doesn't matter, right? Uh, uh, we have an order impulse towards authority, structure, and rules, uh, or authority, structure, law, and cohesion. We have a rules impulse about what's fair. You know, you give, uh, you know, two, three-year-olds, you give somebody eight gummy, uh, gummy, bear, or gummy worms or whatever, and the other kid you give two, they go, that's not fair. I mean, this is an impulse that we have inside. Then we have an autonomy, a rights impulse of what's mine, etc. We have a loyalty impulse. It's how we build coalitions, agencies. It's how we know where we belong. And, and we start out with these impulses, but they get conditioned. So we get raised as an FSU uh, family, right? And we're just loyal to FSU because daddy went to FSU and granddaddy went to FSU and uh, auntie went to FSU and we're just Seminoles uh, all the way through. And then, of course, Gators people know how immoral that impulse is. So, uh, uh, and then we have a sanctity impulse that we just believe, we would call this the divine mind if you were coming from a, theater, a theist idea or spiritual idea, but we believe that certain things are just imbued with value, they're imbued with reverence. And so these internal moral impulses, you and I have them. So going back now, considering um, how two people can see the same thing and react differently, uh, we see the exact same video, but we react from a, a, a different lead moral impulse. And the way this happens is uh, it comes out of what we call external moral triggers. So catch it here. We have the internal moral impulse. This is what we were made uh, with. And then out in the world, we have these external moral triggers. What are these external moral triggers? Well, we observe cruelty, right? Uh, and it agitates or activates our mercy impulse. We observe lawlessness and anarchy, and it activates an order impulse. We observe in- inequity and justice, and it activates a rules impulse or tyranny, and it activates autonomy. We see betrayal, duplicity, and it's like, how could they do that, right? You know, how could she marry a gator? I mean, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, uh, how could, you know, a Seminole marry a gator, et cetera? Uh, and then we have a, a sanctity impulse, and when we see corruption or defilement, or we see something like a statue that we feel, and, and it can be it can be a George Floyd statue, and you say, my gosh, how could anybody deface that? It could be, a, you know, an Andrew Jackson statue and somebody said well yeah but George is righteous and Andrew is not or Andrew's righteous and George is not we're, we're not dealing with facts at this point we're just dealing with how we navigate the world how we experience the world and the way God created us or the way we evolve to interact with the world is we interact not with brain first but with impulse first as a matter of fact our reason is really um a, a servant I was gonna say slave but it's a servant to our impulse and we we kind of have an impulse and then and then we don't ask reason how to think about it reasonably or, or rationally. We ask uh, reason and rational, rationality uh, what things will support my innate moral impulse. And so uh, a lot of times what you'll see is you'll um, uh, see how these are opposite. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody will see inequity and justice and it might trigger their uh, mercy impulse, right? Uh, or, or somebody might see chaos uh, and it, it might trigger their... Uh, 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 rights and liberty uh, impulse, or uh, somebody will see uh, cruelty and it'll actually trigger into the, the me, mine, us, them impulse, or, or somebody may uh, or, you know, be dealing in a place of authority and law, but it may uh, activate uh, somebody being upset over a sanctity impulse, or they may see you know, tyranny, oh my gosh, uh, you, know, you messed with the votes, uh, you messed with the election count, uh, and that's tyranny, and it triggers uh, you know, that, that, that violation where, where a person watches the news and says they're stealing the election. Uh, 
So when they feel that they're under tyranny, that's the trigger. It triggers, you know, this is God's land and God's nation. It triggers, you know, we're Americans. Uh, it triggers, I have rights and you're trampling on my right. It triggers, they're not being fair. They can't win legitimacy. It triggers, they're breaking laws. Uh, it triggers, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're, uh, you know, I feel victimized here. So it doesn't take much to activate these moral impulses once we, once one of these triggers are engaged. And again, I hope you're catching it, but let's go on a little bit further. So, um, and if you want to screen capture this, I can't write all this down. Well, it's right there for you. You can screen capture it. So uh, I want you to consider the George Floyd summer. So uh, what happened with all the BLM and all the things going on, and it seemed like uh, there was issue after issue as there was law enforcement issue, law enforcement issue, after issue. So I want you to think about it. If, if depending on what side you're on, if you're for the protest, right, uh, you interpret what's happening as tyranny, right? You interpret what's happening as corruption, right? And, and when you see the tyranny and the corruption or you see the injustice, uh, or you see the cruelty, you know, you feel like that was cruelty, then it triggers an impulse in you. What, trig what impulse does it trigger? It, trig you, it triggers a fairness impulse. It triggers a rights impulse. It triggers an identity impulse. And so, uh, uh, you know, it triggers a, a sanctity, right, endowed with uh, divine rights by our creator, uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So you see the video of George Floyd, and you see it, and it triggers something inside you. Um, and, but now at the same time, so the George Floyd summer, as people start taking to the streets, it's not everybody is for the George Floyd summer. Why? Because some people see the George Floyd summer and they don't see it as uh, standing up to tyranny. They see it as, oh my gosh, look at this chaos and anarchy, right? Oh my gosh, look at how they're just destroying these shops and, and, and people are being trampled on. So a shop owner just got killed. Or, oh my gosh, they're uh, betraying, you know, our national foundations. Or, uh, you know, they're, they're corrupting. Look at that. They're, they're tearing down these statues that I hold dear. They're not focused on the inequity or the injustice. Other parts of their moral impulse are being triggered. And we all come at it. You can't read this as, um, uh, you know, uh, oh, you know, so uh, my impulses are superior. It's not impulses are superior, nor can you, or inferior. It's just the way we feel about a situation. And when we feel a certain way about a situation, we're drawn to news that supports how we feel. We're drawn to social media feeds that supports how we feel. Even in an article, we'll skip over and, and, and bypass mentally. They say our nose can, is in our peripheral vision at all times, that our eyes see it at all times, uh, uh, it, or is in the line of sight, but our brain blocks it out. We can read an article that has facts that go against our impulse. We don't even see those facts. We absorb hungry, hungry hippos, the things that support our innate moral impulse. And so what you literally have is you have uh, people that feel two different things. So in George Floyd Summer, people are taken to the streets uh, and they feel like, yeah, we're taken to the streets. And, and, and so George Floyd Summer protests would be like, okay, yeah, I do see that they're tearing down buildings, but, but I'm not out here support of that. As a matter of fact, they said that's not even our group. Why? Because our group is out here standing up for rights. Right. Uh, or they'll say, OK, yeah, I totally agree uh, that, you know, um, uh, you know, they're tearing down sacred statues and burning flags, etc. And I totally agree that it looks like a, a betrayal and duplicity. But then they'll say at the same time, but don't you see I'm standing up against tyranny? Are you not aware of the inequity and the injustice is happening? So we're, it's not that, it's not that the, 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 the anti-BLM group and the pro-BLM group have different impulses. It's that they're playing their cards in different order and they're not doing it consciously. You know, when I, when, I, when I look at the George Floyd situation and I say, yeah, okay, I mean, I don't agree that he should have been killed like that, but if he hadn't have done this, and but if he hadn't have done this, and but if he had only done this, I'm moving on to a secondary impulse where somebody else will say, I don't care what he did. This is obviously, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is obviously, watch this, identity, right? This is obviously, a black person may say, an attack on us. Or even if you're not black, they may say, this is obviously a, a, an attack on justice and accountability. And so when I get a trigger, because I feel like one of my uh, observations externally is triggered, I respond with a moral impulse. But somebody could be watching, you know, cities burn and targets go down, and, and they'll say, oh my gosh, do you see this anarchy? Where is the law enforcement? And here's where the irony comes in, because the people that are protesting about George Floyd's murder were actually protesting against the violation of his rights, against the dismissal of their personhood, and they were actually crying out for more law enforcement. Why is the laws not being enforced about us being protected? And, and, and our, so, so there's an outcry for law enforcement. It gets expressed in chaos, what's called chaos and anarchy, and then it's slammed by the other group as, a, as, a, as, a, as an affront to the moral impulse of authority and order, etc. Now, here's, here's where you, you become self-aware, and this is the key to our, to our breakthrough, right? You become self-aware here, 
Uh, back on the screens, Livy, if you would. So what? How, how could you apply these things? You're fine, baby. Isn't Livy's like, I'm never on the ones and twos. I'm never on the ones and twos. You're doing great. So how can you apply the same idea to the January 6th, right? So the people who are watching the chaos of the George Floyd summer and saying, oh my gosh, look at this chaos. Where is the authority? Where are the rules, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, where, you know um, uh, where, where's the sanctity? But those same people that were doing that you know, were condemning chaos, right? They were willing to engage in chaos on January 6th. Why? Because they felt like uh, the vote was being stolen as a form of tyranny. They felt like there was corruption. And when you have corruption, you can say, you know what? If there's corruption, if there's tyranny, and if there's, uh, uh, if there's corruption, tyranny, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, violation of authority, then I am justified in creating chaos. And again, keep in mind, the George Floyd uh, BLM protesters are saying, okay, they're tearing up targets, but that's not us. Okay, they're out here blowing up, but that's people pretending to be on our side, and they're putting on, that's, that's Trump and MAGA people putting on BLM uh, gear and causing chaos to try to disrupt our cause. And is it an interesting that on January 6th, the exact same argument, argument. Okay, there are people out here, uh, you know, tearing up the Capitol building and doing, but that wasn't us. That was Antifa putting on Trump stuff to try to pretend that it was us. But both people are coming at it from what they feel is a moral instinct, the moral response. All, you know, they're feeling like, you know what, I I am being loyal to mercy, loyal to order, loyal to rules, autonomy, uh, loyalty, uh, you know, sanctity. And and I am condemning the cruelty and the chaos and the iniquity and the tyranny and the betrayal and the corruption. But, But both parties see it the exact same. So where do we get to? we get to this, that our feelings about right and wrong, right at the bottom of your screen, they end up driving, uh, or excuse me, our feelings about good and evil end up driving our facts about right and wrong. And here's the, here's the thing about it. Our feelings, notice at the bottom, the exclamation points, our feelings are certain. We know what we feel is right. We just know we're on the right side, we're on the good side, and they're on the evil side. But our facts are question marks. Why? Are they really our facts? Can we even trust our facts? How do we trust our facts? And again, I'm not saying that there's alternate facts. I'm not saying that facts aren't facts. I'm just saying... We don't first experience the facts. We carry our feelings and we mine and filter the facts according to our feelings. And if you want to function as a healthy human being, you've got to start with a healthy dose of self-skepticism, right? And disrupt your echo chamber to make sure that you're just not responding uh, letting your impulses lead and making your logic serve it, but you have to learn to process these things apart from uh, uh, your initial impulse, etc. So where does all this tie in? Capture this on your screen if you want to. How does all this tie into white supremacy? Well, let's look at it. Unless we intentionally engage in the uncommon self-discipline uh, of, of uh, you know, uh, self-skepticism and echo disruption, our default is going to be to marshal our collected and curated facts in a manner that suits our intuitive and impulsive feelings. The facts that I find about the vaccine or about abortion or about whatever, uh, you know, I, I, have, I have the same internet available to you that you have to me, or the, uh, to me that you have to you, but when I Google my position on abortion, the articles that I find up, I pull up, the ones I skip over are the ones that don't suit my impulses. The ones I latch onto are the ones that suit my impulses. And Google and all our search engines are smart enough to realize what we skip over over time, and they don't even begin to show us the ones it knows we're going to skip over. They begin to push the ones we know we're going to connect. And now I'm getting fortified, not in a rational position, but in a feeling position, right? So we do this immediately, in, in subconsciously and predictably. I, I, and when it comes to white supremacy, when it comes to being division over news, I don't think, hmm, what's going to suit my white interest here? I think, oh my gosh, I see this. And I see it instantly. I see it subconsciously and I see it predictably. And then I immediately move into highlighting, prioritizing and emphasizing and weaponizing five things. First, I weaponize the context, right, of what happened. I I take my time to set the context, right? I I weaponize the timeline of what started when and who started what and when when, when the relevance should stop and when it should end, right, start and end. Systemic confidence. I weaponize my confidence in the system. Well, the system, the system works or the system's corrupt. It, depending on which card I play, I got a whole stack of cards. I got 52 cards. I could play my, the system works for itself. We got to let it. Or I could speak my, the system is corrupt. I could play two different cards, but I'm playing them according to my impulse. Number four, I weaponize the villainy in the situation. Who are the real bad guys? And then finally, I weaponize the outrage and indignation, what we should be upset about. And I say, well, you shouldn't be upset about this. You should be upset about that. Or they're upset about something stupid. And I see what they're saying, but the bigger point is, and so this is how we interact with the world, but we're not doing it based on facts. We're not even doing it consistently because depending on how the situation suits me and how it marshals my impulses. I may play an ace one time uh, as an opener, uh, you know, in spades. I may play, I don't even know, I, I've only played spades twice. 
uh, whatever I did, I must have played it right because we took him to Boston or whatever it is. And, and then they told me to quit. I took him to Boston and walked out. So I guess that's a good thing. I guess we got all 13 books or whatever. doesn't matter. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I only played once. Um, but, but I may lead with one card in one hand and lead with another card in another hand depending on what the game is, depending on what the strategy is. And it's not that I'm being manipulative. It's not that I'm going, hmm, uh, you know, I think this calls for order and this calls for tyranny and this calls for rights and this calls for sanctity and this calls for mercy. These things bubble up in me by the way I've been conditioned throughout my life we talked about it last week, and I play them involuntarily. And here's the thing, I play them with each and every news item that I see. Hope you're hanging on. It's been a good lunch. Is everybody still out there? You still out there? You still hanging on? Okay, so where does white supremacy come in? It comes into this idea of loyalty. Bottom of your screen here, loyalty is where I gain a sense of identity and a sense of self, right? Loyalty is how I define the words me, mine, us, and ours. It's how I define we and they. I gave you an example last week of a sports team, right? Was the guy's foot inbounds or was it out of bounds? Did he catch the ball or did he not? Was that a foul or a penalty? I can't believe, you know, I think everybody saw uh, when um, – the um, Saints were playing the Rams uh, in the NFC title game before the Super Bowl. Everybody saw that pass interference. Everybody knows the refs turned their back. I mean, you had to be blind to do it. But I spoke as a Saints fan, right? If you're a Rams fan, they go, oh, come on. And here's how you weaponize the timeline. Okay, right there, maybe, but they didn't call the play two times earlier. You're not even experiencing the game through its factual existence. You're experiencing through the lens of your biases, uh, uh, through the mean, mine, us, and ours. Who dat, who dat, who dat? We dat, right? And we dat, we know we got robbed by the refs on that day. And people say, oh, my gosh, you're still talking about that. What am I dealing? We're not dealing with the facts of the game. We're dealing with the impulses uh, and how we see it through us. So in my saturation, somebody say, you can't talk about this. I can't believe you fell for this white supremacy narrative. I'm not talking about a narrative. I'm talking about my life as a person. I'm sharing my story. My saturation in environments and experiences that subconsciously condition me towards whiteness as my primary self-identity, they affected how I act with the world. Nobody, uh, well, I was going to say, nobody sat down and told me you're white. Actually, they did. A uh, family member said, no, you're white, right? And you need to remember that. And this person over here, no matter how rich they are, no matter how, I just wrote this in my new book, no matter how rich they are, no matter where they come from, they'll always be an inward, and they'll never be as good as you because you're white. So that was the overt. But it didn't really take the overt. I, I absorbed that, right? In my teachers, in my principals, in my presidents, in my politicians, in my tele, I absorbed that whiteness is the default experience for life. And that that allowing the, the, the idea of the we and they, right, or the us and them, the usness, the we-ness and the they-ness to be attached to, not party first, not, you know, Christian or non-Christian first, or not a uh, human or non-human. Uh, uh, I, I don't have, an, uh, my primary impulse was not always mercy, order, rules, uh, autonomy, or sanctity. My primary impulse was conditioned to be seeing myself through the lens of whiteness, captured on your screen, and we'll move forward here. Okay, so let's, so let's see. This is Mike, right? Mike, Mike looks at, you know, Colin Kaepernick, or Michael Brown, or, or uh, Jordan Davis, or Brianna Taylor, or George Floyd, or uh, uh, Trayvon, Brother Trayvon, uh, uh, Philando Castile, right? He looks at it, and, and what comes first? Does he approach it with mercy first, or does he approach it with order first, or does he approach it with autonomy, or does he approach it with rules? I never get to uh, these impulses to evaluate or consider it in that light. Why? Because the first thing that pops up in my brain as I interpret the news is the condition, loyalty, identity, and whiteness that I have. And again, I don't do this intentionally. I don't say, wait a minute, what's the white interest here? It's, it's, this is not, this is not a, 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 a conscious thought thing. It's a subconscious thought, right? I have to have skepticism. I have to have echo disruption to, to distance myself from it, to dematrix myself. But I don't sit there and think, hmm, you know, WWPD, uh, uh, WWW right? What would a white person do? I don't, I don't think of it, right? What would a white person do? WWPD, I don't think of it in that terms. It just, it, it pops up in my brain to see it that way. This is my, I didn't come out of the womb that way, right? I came out of the womb with a 52 deck of cards, but over time the cards were shuffled. And even when I don't think about what I'm going to play first, the first card that I get laid down, the first that I get laid down. And it's taken me a while to pause and, and to become suspicious and skeptical of my innate impulses and to go, wait a minute, I've been triggered here by something I observe. That's chaos. That's a disorder. That's lack of care. And, 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 and something triggers in me, but, but if, if my impulses are are all subservient, right? That I that I don't really have a mercy, uh, order, rules, sanctity, uh, autonomy, impulse, but all of those are repressed, and so that they all have to be filtered through the identity of whiteness. Now, all of a sudden, I end up watching all the news through a, a white lens. And and somebody said, you know, and again, peace be unto this dear brother. It was like, I can't believe you fell for that narrative. This is not a narrative. This is my life. This is my life. It, it took me a while to realize that's what I do. 
It took me a while, and that's why I say I'm a recovering white supremacist. What do you mean recovering white supremacist? Because this has been put in my blut and bone, right? From you know, to borrow from Herr uh, Hitler, right? Uh, 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 that that uh, that my blood and soil has been conditioned to see the world through this. So I don't say, hmm, what is? I don't I don't approach it from a, a sanctity situation with Colin Kaepernick. What is his rights as a human being, or what is his rights, uh, uh, you know, uh, to appeal to tyranny, or what is his right to call for uh, order? I approach it from a different thing. Now I may say, don't disrespect the flag. Why? Because the flag is sacred. I, I'm activating a sanctity idea, but why did I reach for that expression of sanctity rather than the sanctity of black lives? Because that version of sanctity passes through my us-them filter of my whiteness. Let me get my scribbles off so you can catch this if you want to. We're going to go forward in five, four, three, two, one. My God, don't disconnect yet. It's just getting good. Here we go. So, um, so we humans lead with our impulses and intuitions. We don't engage our reasoning until after the fact. We feel it, then we argue it, right? We or we rationalize it. Whenever I intuitively interpret the news through the uh, through my whiteness, I invariably and involuntarily find myself reasoning in ways that catch this, ways that downplay white responsibility and exaggerate black culpability. So, did I see the George Floyd video? Yes, I did. Did I, do, I, do I see the, uh, you know, do I see the Trayvon Martin trial? Yes, I did. But I have learned, and this takes a conscious effort, intention, intervention, interruption, uh, 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 mindfulness, etc., to pause and go, you know what? I don't understand what they are so upset about. I don't understand why they can't see it clearly. My God, and I have to pause and go, wait a minute, am I speaking through the filter of identity? Because that's my longest, most consistent self-narrative. That comes out of my child. I was aware of the otherness of them uh, before I was even in school, and I don't know where that came from. Uh, I, I, it comes from a moral impulse to build bonds with allegiance, but every moral impulse can be co-opted immorally. So when I see this idea and I go through the news and I go, wow, how come I constantly see the news in a way that downplays white accountability? I can't even find a color that you can see. That downplays white account responsibility and exaggerates black culpability. Well, let's go on here a little bit further. I do this subconsciously. When I react emotionally, intuitively, impulsively it's my starting point and from that starting point i instinctively begin to formulate my factual conclusion well they this and they came from there and everybody knows and you should see and i bet if you find out and that law says this and you can and, and, and i'm starting to summon facts in support of my position that are not really facts at all they're just curated uh, filtered versions to support my impulse so we go on a little bit further here this process is instant and immediate uh, I feel certain about it. That's what makes it so dangerous. I feel certain. I look at George Floyd Summer. I look at January 6th. I look at Rodney King. I look at O.J. Simpson. I look, I mean, just go over and over. And I feel certain. I feel certain. And then the certainty, the certainty should be triggering you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's not that these are inferior human beings have an opposite reaction to me. It's not that they just don't know or they just blind or they're just taking the pills or drinking the Kool-Aid. I can't be so morally self-righteous, intellectually self, self-righteous and self-superior that I go, they just don't know. It can't just be that I'm that much better than people. And when I realize that I'm not that much better than people and I pause to acknowledge my human frailty and I pause to acknowledge the possibility that I've been filtered, then all of a sudden I'm able to break through. We've got about a minute left, but we're going to go into overtime. It'll be like a great game here. So I feel certain uh, I'm confident in my facts, and I'm resistant to further processing. Once I've locked in on my intuitive impulse, it's hard to get me to see it. So, well, you know, um, it's hard to get me to see it. Uh, I'm hesitant to allow other impulses to lead. This is an interesting thought. Let me see if I can go back here. I don't know if I can. Um, let me see if I can go back. So when I say hesitant to allow other impulses to lead, it'd be interesting if I reprocessed all of these impulses uh, by saying, hmm, I wonder if I looked at these situations uh, with mercy first, or with order first, or with autonomy first. Would I see them a different way? But it's hard to get to any of those places when this is my dominant thought. So let's go on here a little bit further uh, to where we were. Um, so the only way out, right, as we said before, is to admit that my innate, mor immor my innate moral impulses, it's possible for those to be conditioned uh, and susceptible to conditioned uh, moral co-option. Um, that that the impulse of uh, of having a family of connecting to I have an impulse to like the Gators or an impulse to like the Seminoles or an impulse like this that 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 can be co opted in an immoral way so that my loyalty to the group that is a necessary moral moral impulse for survival and cooperation 
that that can be corrupted in a way that it becomes immoral in its application. That's what white supremacy did to me. That's, uh, that's the idea. Uh, what I've said, I was a white supremacist. No, I don't think it's white supremacist like Sinbad about going, said about going to Denny's. You don't set out to go to Denny's. You just wind up there. I didn't set out to be a white supremacist. I found as I went into my late 20s and 30s, man, th- that the idea of whiteness shapes a lot of the way that I see the world. Okay, let's go here a little bit further. Um, let's see how far we get. So, so how do I do this? I'll give you these five points and then we'll close. Um, at least five points. Are you still out there, Connor? Are people still on? Okay, good. That's fine. Um, I don't know. I'm assuming you're out there. If not, I'm just talking. Five different things. So how do I, how do I stop watching the news as a white person? What do I do? Well, I conter- curtail uh, my compulsion to colonize the context of what happens. What do I mean by colonize? That I, that I take my whiteness and enter into a place and say, and say and dictate what the rules are. And I do this. I find I do this as I watch news stories. I watch the same news stories you do. I don't end up at this place. I start out at this place. I start out at like, oh, well, obviously. And it's, oh, well, obviously, is, is something in me that's, that's determining the context of what happened before I even know the facts about it, right? And it usually, somebody says, well, how do you know it's white supremacy? Uh, uh, because it, it usually supports the idea of white rightness in the situation. So I had to stop dictating when race or race isn't a factor. Race isn't a factor here. You're just making race a factor. Well, that's that. I, I don't get to determine that context, right? I have to stop insisting that each incident be evaluated solely on its own factual merits. Why are y'all trying to inject race into it? Everybody, why everything has to have race into it now? Well, it's not that everything has to have race into it now. It's that we have a, a history where race was in everything. It's tyrannical of me, right, to retroactively strip race from the complex goings on. Uh, in America, that I can say, oh my gosh, are we still there? Are you serious? Are we still there? Oh, I'm so tired of it. That's tyrannical, right? For me to say uh, uh, that race has, is, is not a factor here. And I'll tell you why. Because none of these issues occur inside a history-free vacuum. Right? There's nothing going on here that hasn't gone on before. It's like each thing is tied to another. I talk about this in relationships, uh, where we uh, one of the phrases we use is certain things in a relationship, there should never be a third time, right? Uh, there can be adultery. There may be adultery a second time. There's not going to be adultery a third time. Why? Because on the second time, I'm out, right? Uh, domestic violence. Well, you know, uh, Tammy slapped Jimmy. Okay, you can't do that. If Tammy slaps Jimmy after counseling everything else, slaps Jimmy a second time, there's not going to be a third time. Why? Because I'm not going to stick around. There are certain uh, non-negotiables, right? Uh, so it's like, oh my gosh, I, yes, I punched you in the face and knocked you out five years ago, and you're bringing that up now? You made it re-relevant when you reactivated it by punching me in the face last week. And so I realized that in my whiteness, I wanted to strip race from the conversation and say, look, let's just start the conversation with what happened in the eight-minute video with George Floyd. Let's just start the conversation with what happened uh, with, with uh, uh, Michael Floyd. Let's just start that Trayvon shouldn't I, I want to start the conversation there, but you can't start these things in a non-racial conversation. Why? Because everything is slathered in the stench of this racial inequality and you're not going to be able to just pick up where the zero is or where we're starting from uh, and that's an expression of white supremacy and listen to this my own heart darkness right my what i know about the ugliness of my own hearts it tells me it's dishonest to assert that the outcome would have been the same no matter it would have been no different than it was black or white i know enough about the ugliness of my own heart to know that's not true I know enough of it could be true, but to assert, oh, you're trying to make it if the cop had been black, if the suspect had been white, it would have been the same thing. That's a form of tyranny where I colonize the context and I can't watch the news like that. Why? Because that's allowing my self-identity and my whiteness to lead. I've got to pause that and go, hmm, let me look at the facts, but let me also look at the reality that as we go into situations, it's why comedians get away with saying stupid, asinine, dumb, satanic stuff like, uh, you know, white people tell their kids, uh, now, Johnny, don't do that. I'll beat you time out, and black people will knock you out, and that's why black parents are so superior, and that's why white kids go and shoot up schools. That is a demonic talking point. We'll talk about that next week. That is a demonic talking point. That's a white supremacist talking point that aggression somehow uh, in violence are necessary to subjection and everything else. And it, it's, it's satanic and demonic, but we laugh and go, <laughs> white parents, they're so nice to their kids, and they don't know that you should beat their kids. This is satanic, dis, you know, dark stuff. And, and, and I know my own heart darkness that I can't say, Oh, there's no narrative about race. Of course there is. There's a narrative about black people, about black women. When you see an interracial couple, you see a white man with a black woman, we've been told who's the dominant personality in that relationship. You see a white woman, I mean, we've been told, we, we are told these things. They exist in the air. And to say in this video of this interaction between a cop and a man or a cop and a woman or a citizen, that, that none of those stories exist, of course they exist. They're in our air, they're in our soil, they're in our DNA. And to go, no, I'm not going to let that be a factor here is a jury we're not supposed
supposed to let that be a factor, but as human beings interacting with these things, you've got to look at it and go, all these dominoes have led to this point. Nothing occurs in a vacuum. Generations of dominoes have fallen, leading up to not only the event itself, where we can't push a button, factor, not a factor, but how we interpret the event. Certainly what we have absorbed over time is a factor. Oh, I'm preaching good. I'm preaching good. <laughs> Number two, uh, if you want to capture that, five, four, three, two, one, Connie tells me to let you count and capture. All right, there it is, captured. Uh, I must turn from the temptation to tinker with the timelines. This is something I know I did. I would always, not, not intentionally, found myself tinkering with the timeline to a place uh, that minimized white culpability. I'll give you an example. So I see the George Floyd tape, right? The guy's kneeling down on his neck, and something my whiteness whispers to me, well, surely now there's more to it than this, right? I mean, obviously, the guy's just not doing this for no reason. What I want to do, I say, you're showing me a video. Let me see more, because if you show me more, it'll show you that the white guy isn't as awful as he looks. See, I want to tinker with the timeline, right? But the other thing is this. I see the Ahmaud Arbery uh, thing. Uh, I'm watching the video. Uh, Ahmaud Arbery runs around the truck, runs right at the guy. The, the black guy's running right at the guy, and he shoots him. And I go... <laughs> What else is there to see? I mean, it's right there. He charged the guy and he shot him. I don't think this in my mind. Let me find a way to make the black person guilty. I see it and instantly make a snap judgment. What? I want to shrink the timeline. I don't go, well, let me see what led up to it, right? You know, uh, let me see what led up to it. And even if I want to stretch the Ahmaud Arbery timeline, I don't say, well, let me see what led up to it. I'm going to say, well, they weren't just chasing him for no reason. He must have done something. So I find I shrink the timeline when it suits my idea of minimizing white culpability, or I want to enlarge the timeline. And that's how I have to strip out of that. And somebody said, well, everybody does that. That's true. You do it too. Red, yellow, brown, black, white, you do it too. But I noticed I was doing it in a way that didn't end up with different results. I was doing it in a way that always minimized white culpability in the situation. You can capture it in three and two and one. Let's go to number three here. We only have five, and you're doing so good. You might as well stay on here with me. It's an extended lunch hour. Tell your boss, hey, I'm not coming. Tell your sales appointment, oh, man, I got stuck in traffic. Traffic on what? On the World Wide Web. Uh, so here it is, number three. I must steer clear of the seduction to skew systemic confidence in a manner that bolsters white innocence. So this is something we play with all the time, right? We at once affirm confidence in the system and question confidence in the system. So when the court goes my way, I say, look, I get objective, right? I wasn't there. I didn't hear it. You didn't hear all the facts. I'm not talking about the news. If you were on the jury, you would have agreed the same way. So I'm saying we got to let the system work. But then I notice that other court cases that I see, I go, well, that's ridiculous. How do they come to that conclusion? Because I can weaponize confidence in the system. Think about it this way. I mean, it just depends on who it is, right? Depends on the case. And, 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 and depending on the case, at one point I might say, man, the court's totally got it right. Or the court's totally got it wrong. Man, I mean, Georgia, right? The, the, look, the experts are dealing with it. They've got the thing. These are the people, the election officials, the, the senators, they're all involved. The, the results are legitimate. Then they pass the voting law. Oh my gosh, they're so corrupt. I'm just weaponizing when, when the powers that be are trustworthy and when the powers that be are not. So, so uh, uh, you know, the Supreme Court, uh, they, they uh, support the guy who doesn't want to make the cake for gay marriage. And I say, see that? You're right on it. But then I say the Supreme Court uh, legalized the same-sex marriage. Oh, my gosh, the court's so wrong. Notice, it's not the court. It's how I want to weaponize the confidence in the system. So when I see OJ and I go, oh, my gosh, you mean a jury can see it and completely ignore the facts and make a decision on race? They just voted that way because of race? But then if I look at Zimmerman and go... Oh my gosh, nobody would ever do that over race, right? They obviously saw the facts and made a sound decision. It's not really confidence in the system. It's weaponized confidence in the system. And I notice instinctively, not intentionally, that as I would go through life over the past 30 years, there would be something in me that would whisper to shuffle the cards in a way that would make it so that there was white innocence rather than white guilt. And that's demonic. And we've got we've to peel those things out of our brain. I, I didn't come out of the womb like that, but slowly my cards were shoveled that way. And it took me, and I'm a Christian. Many of you are not Christians. That's fine. I'm a Christian atheist. It took me waking up to Christ, not to religion, not to a conversion to a church or whatever all this stuff is here, but to actually encountering the living God and to seeing humanity as itself and to getting out of this weaponized us versus them idea of God, it totally changed my perspective. And then I began to fight inside the church for like 15 years against it, and then I finally had to leave. Okay, another thing. So let's move on. Capture it if you want to. So I don't know who these people are. You should look them up and see how you feel about each case. Was the system right or was the system wrong? Number four, I must ignore the inclination to invoke villainy in a manner that... 
uh, amplifies white values, and notice this white value, the value of white life. So what I mean by that is villainy, right? I have to see some of my inconsistent designation of each party's moral reputations as relevant and irrelevant. Well, they were a good person, they were a bad person. I'm, I'm surprised at my own hard ugliness is how I play that cards uh, in a way that uh, uh, you know amplifies white values and white value. I'll give you an example. So uh, in the Breonna Taylor, Breonna Taylor situation, I'm going to say, well, obviously she wasn't doing anything wrong that night. She was sleeping, but dot, dot, dot. You look into her past. She was with some rowdy people and da-da-da-da. Why? I go into her moral reputation, and I say her past is a factor, right? I say, well, I know she didn't do anything in the moment, but if you make it bigger and look at who she really was, she was dating a drug dealer and had some really bad people around her, and she was... So it's like, I, I say, I'm not going to just look at the situation factually. I'm going to enlarge the picture reputationally. But you know what I can do? I can do the same thing. I can say, look, I'm not saying Zimmerman's a saint. Look, I know the guy's a scumbag. He beat his wife or whatever the church is. But that night, right, he, he didn't do anything wrong. So notice, in the Breonna Taylor, I want to make her moral reputation a factor. In the George Zimmerman, I want to shrink it so that it's not a factor. How did I do that? Something in me says do that in a way that amplifies the value of the, not, of the white person and uh, the values of the white person, the value of the white person. Or another thing I've seen, uh, you know, I agree, Trayvon uh, didn't deserve what happened that night. Notice it's that night, it's that night, it's that night. But from the way his life was going, it looks like he was headed for the penitentiary or the cemetery. Anyway, what's so sad about this thing down here is that it was actually a white pastor that told me this. Yeah, I agree, Zimmerman shouldn't have done that, it was wrong, but if you look at where that, that young black kid was going, he was going to wind up in jail one day or killed anyway. So now all of a sudden, I've noticed that whiteness has the ability to not only make the past a factor or the past non-factor it has a crystal ball to say the future is a factor look just but judging by this guy's morals it was only a matter of time probably for another black guy shot him anyway notice how we devalue the life of the black person or we devalue the morality of the black person selectively when we allow our identity impulse to lead how we interpret and experience the news Woo! i, I must ignore uh, this compulsion also i have to cease right uh, my inconsistent valuation of the lives that are lost and affected, as though some life is cheaper than other life, right? Uh, this is only possible, right, that it's not that big of a loss when I remove the racial otherness from my empathetic filter. See, what happens is when you're, when you're in condition in whiteness and you see another person, the color makes one degree of separation. They're not exactly like me, right? So when I look at a Haitian earthquake, it's not exactly like me. When I look at a New York flooding or, 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 or an Alabama tornado and I see people that look exactly like me, that color separation, that language separation, that religious separation, the bombing, uh, the, the explosion in Libya, right? It's, uh, uh, or Le Lebanon, I forget where it exploded. Uh, was it Lebanon? Okay. Uh, when, when I see that explosion, do I feel it on the same level? Oh, those are mothers, those are fathers, those are this or that. Yeah, but they're not exactly religiously, language, nationally, skin color. They're not exactly like me. So anything that, an that just adds the very thin degrees of separation, I don't feel it at its true empathetic level. It takes consciousness to yank that darkness out, to deprogram from that. And ah, oh, finally, number five, you never thought we'd get here, but this is it, I promise. I must opt out of each opportunity to one-up the outrage in a manner that amplifies white indignation. What I mean by one-up the outrage, it's immoral to dismiss their primary anger for the sake of my secondary anger. What do I mean by that? Well, what they're angry about is, is, is not that big of a deal. Okay, so, so a bad situation with law enforcement happens. It's a stressful job. So what is that? It's a feeble stipulation. I'll stipulate that it was, shouldn't have gone that way. I'll patronize. Okay, yeah, I guess. But, and now when I, I'm saying what you're saying is true, but what? I'm trying to get to my anger because my anger is nobler than yours. That, that when, when I deal with you, I'm patronizing with what's upsetting you, but I'm impassioned by what's upsetting me. What you're saying, look, there's, there's 10,000 things a day, and, and, and most of the time it's the black guy that does all the stuff, and the, and the white cop is just... So, so I, I'm, not saying that, I'm not saying that officer so-and-so shouldn't have done that, but what am I doing? I'm, I'm pushing what you're upset about down because you're leading with a care impulse. Right? You're leading with a mercy impulse. You're leading with a rights impulse. But I'm pushing that aside and leading with an order, law and order impulse. But we got to do something. But Chicago. But black on black crime. Which is what? I'm taking yours and making it smaller. And I'm taking mine and making it larger. And that's, that's one upping the anger. Or I'll say, yeah, 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 what you're talking about is that. But I'll move to the secondary thing. So I am completely silent on social media watching an eight minute video of somebody be killed. But when I see Target on fire, look, 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 what? Here's a, I'm not saying what. What happened to George Floyd was right, but we can't be. So it's the secondary, but that I want to amplify that my anger is somehow nobler uh, or superior to yours. And the final slide. 
I must never lose sight of the fact. We're right here. I hope you're still with me. I must never lose sight of the fact uh, that anger is never a primary emotion. This is big. When you see people online that are angry, it's never a primary emotion. So when the Rittenhouse verdict came out and I saw uh, black people in my social media feeds, celebrities, etc., going, oh my gosh, I'm so upset. I'm so There's something in my white filter that goes, what are they upset about now? But I can't live with what are they upset about. i got to pause. Why? Anger is not a primary emotion. It's a secondary emotion, which means what? I've got to listen for the hurt because a lot of times we're seeing anger, but anger is the secondary emotion to hurt. Or I've got to listen out for the fear. Right? When you see the abortion debate, and you see people angry, you're taking away my rights. You're da, da, da. You, it's easy to go, well, God says, and what about the life of the child? You've got to pause for a second and say, where is this anger coming from? Beneath the anger is fear. Beneath the anger is hurt. There's somebody that's been hurt. There's somebody that's afraid of, of what the powerful system may do. And if we just match anger for anger, we're not going to hear it. But if we pause and go, okay, what, where is the hurt here? Where is the fear here? Now we're going to be able to connect empathetically. And here's the thing about anger. Uh, here's the thing about anger and uh, uh Fear, they don't hurt and excuse me, and fear, they don't have to be um, irrational. Excuse me, they don't have to be rational. These, that should have said that. These don't have to be rational to be real. So um, let's, say, uh, let's say I'm married to a person who's uh, a woman who's been sexually abused, right? And she was always sexually abused by her stepfather, and she would be in her bed at 14 years old, and she knew when everybody had gone to bed that he would come down to her room and abuse her. Let's just say this happens for two or three years, 14 to 16, 17, whatever. And she would be in her bed at night trying to pretend she was asleep. And when she would hear the door handle open on his bedroom door quietly and latch, all her fear response would go as she could hear him coming down the hall. And she never forgets that opening of that door the way it opened. So he's out of her life. He's died. It's 40 years later. We're on our 20th anniversary or whatever. We go to a bed and breakfast. And while we're getting ready at the bed and breakfast in this great mountain resort, another bed and breakfast person opens a door down the hall. And I look over my wife and I see terror in her face. Now, the fear she's feeling is real. And I say, what's going on? I don't know. I just heard that thing. And I go, well, wait a minute. The guy you're afraid of is dead. That guy's 90 years old. He's not going to come bother you. I'm appealing to rationality. But fear doesn't have to be rational to be real. And so sometimes when you see somebody reacting to something online and you say, this is so stupid. You're trying to make it about black, white, and it's not even there. Pause before you one-up the outrage and listen, what is the fear beneath what you're hearing? Because even though it may not be rationally, you know, you say, well, that's irrational to feel that way, but fear is never rational. But the anger and the terror and what comes over us, it doesn't self-originate, it comes from somewhere. And in this country, what you would call as a white person, what I would call as a white person, this is just so irrational that you would be that upset. I mean, the guy clearly charged a police officer, what's the problem? We try to reduce it down to itself. Well, the upsetness comes at, it's not just that four minute video, it's hundreds of years, individual experiences, things they've lived through, a thousand such images that they've seen like that these things compile and you want to you and i want to jump to the rationality side without pausing to say before i say you shouldn't be upset about this now i'm upset about you're upset and the way you're acting out on your upset and now your second wrong doesn't make and that's just all self-righteous bullcrap and the truth of the matter is as human beings we got to pause and say why am i not feeling this like they feel it and is it unrighteous of me to one-up the anger that i feel over there for you. I'll give you two examples. So the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict came out, right? And I saw people on my social media saying, uh, and this is a real quote, the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict means it's open season on black people. They just made it legal to murder us. And, and you look at that and you go, ah, that's a stretch. And it is a stretch. It's hard to draw a rational, logical line to that because Kyle Rittenhouse and all the pooch screw things that went wrong there, major things that went wrong. I'm talking about, I don't care how narrow or how far out you want to make the timeline. It, it, it screwed up. But where a black person go, okay, I guess they're just going to kill my son now. That's, that's, a, that's a rational leap, but it's an emotional reality, right? The, irra- the irrational leap says, so Kyle Rittenhouse getting off for his crimes uh, somehow means my son is going to be killed. Well, really what's happening is there was already a subconscious fear based on the place that we live about the death of these young black men. That's already there. And this comes across not, within a, ra- oh, not with a rational line of logic, but with an agitation of picking the scab on fear and hurt and devaluing that's already there. I'll give you an example that white people can understand. Colin Kaepernick kneeling on the flag, people are, white people are, oh my gosh, you just spit on my grandfather's grave. This blankety blank spit on my grandfather's grave, I can't believe. My granddad was a World War II veteran, gave his life at Normandy, and this guy just came over and pulled his pants down and took a big dump on my, and I mean rage. And you say, wait a minute, that's, that's not rational. That, there's, there's literally no rational connection 
with him kneeling down as an expression of his sanctity impulse, his rights impulse, his autonomy impulse, his order impulse, his authority impulse, his mercy impulse. He's acting on those impulses in opposition to what he perceives as cruelty and all these other kind of things. But guess what? You see it and you feel it. You feel like he has just slapped granddaddy, like he went out there to Private Ryan and urinated over every grave on that beach. Where did that come from? It's not rational. We're not dealing with rationality. You saw it as an affront to things you hold sacred, the flag, to order and law that you th the rules that you think the NFL made. And we're actually not experiencing it on a factual level. We're experiencing it on an emotional level. And I'm saying the response to the flag in Colin Kaepernick is really irrational. The response to Kyle Rittenhouse in, I mean, corruption, so many layers I'd have to dedicate 100 episodes to it that's so dark but we're not really dealing with that, are we? We're dealing with human beings who are feeling things that have to figure out why they're feeling those things. And if you're feeling it through your whiteness, I encourage you, you're going to have to pause that and slow that down and go, okay, what if another impulse, what if I could pause my whiteness long enough to say, these are black people that I know, that I fellowship with, that are online raging over the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict. And instead of great, 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 great granddaddy and all the things that are in me that say, well, there they go again, that's my impulse. How do I become skeptical of that? How do I pause that to say, what are you feeling? What moral impulse is being triggered in you by the external immoral triggers that are existing in the world? And now I'm able to see not the news as a white person sees it. I'm able to see the news as a human being sees it, or as I would argue, as Christ would see it because Christ would be able to acknowledge the humanity and the fear and the hurt at the root of the outrage. But I came, became suspicious as why does my outrage over things always done in a manner that supports white indignation and minimizes black indignation? And that's all the time we have for today. I hope you got something. White Supremacy Wednesdays, it's how we spend our lunchtime. So I can't eat this every day with you for an hour. I try to do 28 minutes. Next week, I'm going to be talking about Malcolm X and the House Negro and the Field Negro. Maybe we'll get through that in 28 minutes. It'll be a great, great time. WSW003, thank you for your support. If this blesses you, if you want to see more of this content, uh, uh, if you want to see more of this content, I think we're over here. Uh, oh, but I go this way. Sorry. Uh, uh, if you want to see more of this content, if you believe in what we're doing, uh, your letters of support, your emails of support, your financial support, this content is put out uh, as a form of ministry that we do, uh, or you can reach us on the apps. It's all right there. Listen, have a great day. Be blessed. I'm sure I upset you. It's part of my charm. Uh, but somewhere in here, even in my clumsy way of saying it, I know I wasn't 100% right in this, but somewhere beneath there, you heard something that will grow you empathetically and make you see the world larger. I'm trying to see the world larger than my whiteness. And hopefully, not for every white person doesn't feel this way. Not every black person is going to be informed. They all know that I understand white supremacy better than you do. I doubt that. <laughs> Uh, you may understand what it's like to be victimized, but you don't understand what it's like to orchestrate it and to live as a beneficiary and being born and bred and benefacted by it. And I'm really betraying state secrets here to put this stuff out. But forget what white people are like or what black people are like. I'm telling you my story. And maybe in my clumsy, screwed up story of where I come from, some truth will come forth that will advance the cause of justice in the world. God bless you.